Welcome to another installment of the Bro Diallo book review. This session we're going to be reviewing Black on Black Violence, the Psychodynamics of Black Self-Annihilation in Service to White Domination. This text was published by African World Info Systems in 1990. Uh, it was dedicated to all my brothers and sisters in the struggle um, by, of course, the late, great Dr. Amoson Wilson. So, I mean, there's a lot to get here. If you've ever read any of uh, Amos Wilson's many uh, magnificent texts, you'll know they're pretty dense. Um, he was a consummate revolutionary radical scholar. So let's just get right into it so that we can get through this in, in a reasonable amount of time. In the introduction, Amos Wilson states that absolute powerlessness as well as absolute power corrupts, which is an old statement uh, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely gives us this false impression that the, the meek, the poor, the powerless are beyond corruption. And also in Judeo-Christian mythology, there's this notion that the poor will inherit the earth and that the poor are somehow the noble poor. And a lot of times it's hard for revolutionaries or conscious people to really talk about the quote unquote crimes of the poor, especially when you have a systemic analysis, you know that most crime, most, most corruption in society is top down from the elites imposed on the oppressed. So when you are talking about the crimes of the poor or the, the crimes of the oppressed, you have to approach it with that universal understanding that we live in a criminogenic society, a society that provokes crime, and most crimes are generated from the top down, from the elites, and imposed on the, the oppressed. And the oppressed engage in criminal behavior, mimicking and maladaptations to that oppression. So, but and that's my one uh, disclaimer. But going into Wilson's text, he states that uh, sociopolitical, he talks about the sociopolitical necessity of black criminality. Um, he said that black criminality serves two basic purposes. Number one, communal repression, meaning that black predatory behavior or oppressed people's predatory behavior towards other oppressed people helps to prevent uprisings and resistance to the true oppressor and then it also serves the purpose of projective stereotyping meaning that the true criminals the oppressors the racists can absolve themselves of their crime by pointing to the criminality of the oppressed in our first quote uh, dr. Wilson states that in the dominant white American consciousness the African male is existentially guilty ie guilty by his mere existence for merely having the audacity to be alive. This is an absolute necessity for white identity to view black men as the criminal, as the corruptors of the society. But it's also seen in most colonial relationships where the colonizers, the invaders, the oppressors, the enslavers will assert that their victims are the corrupt ones are the evil ones are the ones who are the threat to the victimizers and it's not even unique to uh racism and oppression of africans you saw that the nazi says that the jews were the criminal element in their society and so on and so forth but to go on uh quantifying a myth the statistics and uh black criminology he talks about how uh, within the five years of the Civil War, the black percentage of the prison population went from close to zero to 33%. Black incarceration performed an economic and political function um, um, for the beliefs of whites. So the whites were able to say that, well, we enslaved and we did these people that what is to believe to be at harm, but we see now that they're off of the shackles. They're a menace to society. They're a burden on the society. Um, and what some of the main drivers for, for, for that early phase of mass incarceration was poverty, uh, lack of schooling, joblessness, and family instability, which, or which is what Dr. Wilson called antecedents of incarceration. 
He states that there is no substantial relationship between social class and the commission of crimes, but there is a very marked relationship between class and conviction of crimes, which means if you look at it from a sociological point of view, uh, as Dr. Wilson was a social scientist, he found that whites, and it's pretty common knowledge now even, that whites consume drugs, engage in theft, and even homicide rates and other forms of uh, violence, domestic violence, property damage, um, even um, like fraternities. Fraternities have been caught engaging in, white fraternities have been caught engaging in everything from sex trafficking to drug trafficking. But fraternities are not looked at as white gangs or white criminal bodies, whereas black youth who come and congregate and, and have fraternal orders, i.e. street gangs or street organizations, are. And this is um, this is um, the state that we find our in, ourselves in to the extent that even black people begin to accept this myth that black criminality is somehow inbred or somehow a greater uh, greater presence in the society than white criminality when the mirror opposite is is the truth. <clears throat> Dr. Wilson quotes um, J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover said, I quote, justice is incidental to law and order, which means also when black people are being brought before the justice system, having justice imposed on, uh, on us, what's really being imposed is the status quo or law and order. And we're not really beneficiaries of U.S. Uh, justice. Um, but let's move on. Um, Let's just try to move, because there's so much here. Let's try to, um, he talks about, um, yeah. He talks about the, where I mentioned earlier that the United States is a criminogenic society. Um, and he talks about, um, in specifically, how whites benefit from criminal, criminalizing blacks, or the criminalization of in the entire black race or black community, or black males in particular. He states that, uh, white criminalization of blacks allows for justification for the denial of civil and human rights, justification for police repression and job discrimination, facilitation of white economic control, subversion of black power, internal fear, disorganization, and disunity. Uh, it provides jobs for whites in the arena of social services and criminal justice. Um, I had a friend who was on probation and I would take him to meet with his probation officer so they, they could, uh, he said I had to drop piss and, and, and very humiliating process. But whenever I take him to the probation office, there would be dozens of these middle class white people just milling around, you know, who had degrees, who had certificates and licenses, and they weren't really any doing any productive work besides policing black people who were supposed to be out of prison you know, through the parole system. So, I mean, there are so many social service and criminal justice jobs where policing, caging, containing black people is their sole source of income for many white college educated professionals. It justifies historical atrocities and ongoing atrocities and the white self image, ego support and self aggrandizement where white people can say, we are the good guys, we bring justice, we bring democracy. They can't claim that if they can't construct a psychological and social, political, social, economic state where black people are the criminals, are the are the predators, and the uh, I'm sorry, there's a motorcycle outside. Me, give it a moment to pass. Is that a motorcycle? Uh, let's keep it moving. If, if it's a problem, we can do it in post. We'll do it live. <laughs> All right. Anyway, Amos Wilson also details, that was what we just went over, was Amos Wilson talking about why it is necessary for white folks to make us criminals. Um, he also goes on to talk about the process of how white people create criminals. How they make this, uh, as Huey P. Newton says, power is the ability to define reality and have it act in a desired manner. So if white folks said we need black folks to be criminals 
and they have the power, the control over the economic, the infrastructure, the priorities, the distribution of resources, the public policy infrastructure, the state. What do they do? How do they turn us into criminals? Well, Amos Wilson said the creation of a black criminal follows this specific process. First, he says the reversal of American institutions functions for blacks. The reversal of American institutions functions for blacks. Where he says the economy, the economic system keeps us poor, the criminal justice system mediates injustice, educational system creates ignorance and intellectual incompetence, family institution breeds broken homes and quote unquote illegitimate children, the health and welfare system catalyzes sickness and neglect, and religious institutions support immorality. So black people have all of these institutions that we look for for certain outcomes. And they give us the opposite of what their stated goal or ambition is. And the same goes not just for institutions, but the specific policies they impose. The war on drugs leads to more readily available drugs. The war on poverty leads to more poverty. You know, housing reform leads to homelessness and so on and so forth. So the reversal of American institutions functions for blacks. And we begin to think something must be wrong with us because we get all these beneficial. We got the police, we got the schools and the teachers, all these institutions trying to help us, healthcare institutions and healthcare outreach. But we, we, we seem to fall behind the more help we get from the system. And it even believes, leads some people to denounce uh, public works and want to denounce welfare and think welfare is keeping us down. Which that's another, but let me not get into that. The second thing they do after reversing institutional functions is internalization of white racism by African Americans. This is done by de-Africanization, suppression of our Africanity, internal alienation, and also by reactionary African Americans believe color of his skin, innate Africanness, and not depravity of the oppressor is negative thought, is negative thoughts and behaviors towards himself and his group. So that means when black people say they shot that boy because he's black, I didn't get the job because I'm black, um, I didn't get do well in school because I'm black, and people say when I, I'm a tar articulate, I talk white, all things black, we think our problem is the fact that we're black and not the fact that they're white. Dick Gregory stated, you never say they did this because I'm black. They did it because they're white. Because the negative is not on us. The negative is not on us. And we also have enough history and enough experiences with Europeans to see that they, oh, I'ma just repeat myself till I'm blue in the face. But when Europeans left Africa, they had already mastered enslavement, colonization, genocide, systematic rape. They didn't happen upon people with black skin and become colonizers, oppressors, and racist. They were xenophobic. They had campaigns of genocide, and these people fought two, not one, but two world wars against each other in one century. So obviously, the color of our skin is not the problem. And if we could all turn white tomorrow, if we could all get that Michael Jackson, Serena Williams treatment and turn white tomorrow, and even secure the bag, invest in crypto or win at the Scott market, that would not stop the predatory violence against us because it's not about us. And go back and watch my book review of the Iceman's Inheritance for, for more in-depth analysis of that. Thirdly, Wilson states that whites set themselves up as the standards and models of behaviors for the black-on-black -black criminal. The black-on-black -black criminal is a mimic or a pale reflection or maybe a dark reflection of white criminality, which means these are characteristics of the black criminal that we get from the being modeled for them by the European colonizer criminal. The self-centeredness, insatiable desire, sociopathic, meaning that they have no substantial loyalties or moral codes. They rationalize their criminal acts they are callous, impulsive, or insidiously compulsive, aggressive, adrenaline junkie, and remorseless. They have social Darwinistic values, uh, arrogant and rebellious, deep need for self 
assurance and the control of his environment, sense of omnipotence, superiority and self-confidence, which drives and justifies conquest, lack of self-knowledge, uh, foresight and uh, self-insight, need to assert and prove superiority, fundamentally a coward and a bully, afraid of betrayal, distrust of love, deep feelings and attachments. They are immature, lash out, uh, to hide insecurity, devoid of effective moral values, long-term commitments, and preeminent goals, culture, and group identity, dehumanizes victims. They are supremacists, fatalistically self-serving, and cunning rationalizers, uh, fear above all else, invisibility, nothing, numbness, nobodiness, and alienation equates violence with masculinity. That is Urugu. That is the Western mind state, Western mentality that has provoked them to commit genocide and colonization on every populated landmass in the world. And these are the same characteristics you find in black on black criminal individuals. And I often ask the question and nobody engages me with this when they try to talk about black street organizations. I ask people, name how black gangs are any way divergent or in opposition to colonizers or the capitalist in their fundamental objectives and their fundamental value system. And to quote Amos Wilson again, the reactionary African American then becomes prone to expressing the same or similar attitudes and behaviors towards his fellow victims and himself as they are expressed towards him by his white American oppression. The black on black criminal has an identity crisis. So in the, in the arena of proper poverty and crime, whites create institutions that foster a constellation of unworthy traits in blacks. The list we just went over, these traits are not inborn. They are cultivated. They are indoctrinated into the black on black criminal. And poverty is the deliberate, vicious robbery, exploitation, and extortions of the labor, wealth, and resources of the African community by the European community. Our poverty is a byproduct of our oppression. So you can't really bring wealth to the black community until you end the poverty of the black community. Okay, and uh, let's talk about wealth and crime. Uh, Wilson goes on to state, middle and ruling classes are more criminal than the poor. They just hide their criminality. And the way that the upper class hide their criminality is number one, by defining what crime is. They simply legislate their crimes in, into legality. Uh, the legalization of, of cannabis is a good example of that. And number two, they define it out of existence. What would be a young black boy, oh, he's a rapist. It turns a, a young white boy, oh, he's just confused. He's curious, he's just boys will be boys. Upper class uh, criminal delegation is even more insidious because they have institutions to enforce for them. And the upper class cr criminals are, the police force are enforcers, criminal enforcers. The armed forces, the military are gangs. Bankers are loan sharks. Sales personas and advertising agents are con artists. Businessmen are extortionists. Diplomats are front men. Corporations run rackets. Consortiums are drug rings or pharmaceutical companies. So. Every crime that we think plagues the hood is present in upper class leg legitimate society. They just redefine it and legislate it to be legal. Amos Wilson states in the text, the psycho spiritual and therefore the true psychological father of the black on black criminal is the racist white American man. The um, American black on black criminal is the psychological son of the white on black criminal who does the work of the Eurocentric patri patriarch who sired him. Black criminals chase the American mirage. Wilson also states to reduce the negative impact of white American lust, vanity, and greed that drives black self annihilation, we must seize ownership of the means of production. And these are the solutions. Radically modify the tastes, desires, values, and needs of the black community, and radically transform the American production and value system, social order, and implement a humane social and economic order.
Notice Amos Wilson didn't say entrepreneur because Amos Wilson wrote the, another very, very crucial book, Blueprint for Black Power. But notice what he says had nothing to do. It's secular. There was no old spiritual reawakening. It's not a moral objective or a spiritual objective. It's not even an economic objective within the terms of functioning or achieving within the existing system. Because seizing the means of, uh, of, of production is going to collapse the standard or the status quo, not to help us integrate into it. So our solution to the black on black criminal who is a mimic, a clone, a bastardized version of the white on white, the white on black criminal seize the means of production, socialism, modify taste, desires, and values of the black community, which is cultural social revolution, and transform American production, which is basically sustainability and, and, and uh, ecology. He basically states that one of the core components of black on black crime is that the system gives us dreams without memes. We have media all around us awakening desires in us and they don't and then they deny us the means or the opportunities to secure those things by moral or legal means. Another quote from the text. The black on black violent criminal is no rebel. This is one of my favorite because this is something I've gotten into a lot of conflicts online with this this fallacy of revolutionary but gangster or this fallacy that black gangs are somehow an armed faction to defend black people against any forms of attacks. Black gangs are not for us. And, uh, and, and I love the album, Revolutionary But Gangster. And I think it's a wonderful idea, but it's a fantasy. And Amos Wilson stated in 1990, three decades ago or more, uh, the black on black violent criminal is no rebel. He is no revolutionary. He is the consummate conformist, the preeminent bourgeois gentle home. He is the outlaw who kills to break the silence, to make visible his invisibility, to make something out of nothingness of his existence. He will be noticed, he will be heard, he will be catered to. So the exact opposite, a revolutionary serves the interests of the people. A black criminal, a black gangster, exploits and extracts from the people and tries to intimidate through violence and other means to force the people to serve him. The black criminal is a childish, savage caricature of his white racist fathers. The black criminals continues Black criminal continues until violence, death, imprisonment, old age, or some born again religious addictions ends his predatory existence. Which I don't know if I fully agree with Dr. Amos Wilson about some black criminals may be beyond reform, but I know personally some black on black predatory criminals who were reformed, who did come to serve the people. But a dormant and black on black criminality seeking the attentions from their masters. So he also goes into detail about why black on black criminals and, and their addiction for flashy cars, uh, gold teeth, diamond jewelry, and finding more and more obnoxious ways to demonstrate that they have monetary fiat and a mass large amount of fiat and wasting a lot of money. And it's not just for flossing for the hood, but it's more so to be seen because of their deep-seated insecurity. And it's more so so that their oppressors can acknowledge their existence more so than to impress other oppressed people. Wilson states that unsupported by power, ownership of land, resources, production, and distribution facilities, a brain choice, an army, a nation of individual consumers is doomed to continue continued subordination, exploitation, and ultimate annihilation. So even though all of these gangsters, these criminals, and even these black celebrities and these other uh, Negro elites, they got money, they, they're riding around. I was just reading an article today about T-Pain, not to pick on him, but he bought a $1.2 million Bugatti and he was talking about his experience with having a, a, a million dollar car. We've now got these black crypto entrepreneurs and these quote unquote black moguls 
when they're all just as vulnerable. Because ultimately, we will we continue to be oppressed, exploited, and ultimately suffer the genocidal fate of all people who remain under Western subjugation. Eventually, we're under a slow genocide campaign right now. But again, again, that is a, another discussion. But it is clear that black consumerism is a vain attempt to rise above the insult while empowering the insulter. Or in another way that I state that black wealth is a ransom to white power. Meaning that you accumulate black wealth and you re-inject that wealth into the system in order, in hopes that that will motivate the oppressors to give you relief from the status of being oppressed. You know, chartered jets, and gated communities, and overseas vacations. You get the benefits of imperialism and suffer fewer or lesser uh, of the realities of being oppressed. It's a ransom you pay. It's not really about being empowered. It's about not being a victim of power. That's what the black elite do. Wilson states that the relative quote unquote non-criminality and quote unquote law abidingness of the vast majority of African American community is not due so much to their moral superiority, better judgment or quote unquote family backgrounds. Rather, it is due in large part to their introjection of the self-serving white American religious conscience, of the white American ethical and cultural values, and the more important, their disparate acceptance of an alien identity. For this, they are even more criminal than their thieving violent brothers. Now this is, is heavy, huh? and I kind of jumped into this, I'm sorry, but Amos Wilson is saying that if you're not a black on black criminal, if you're not a gangbanger, don't sit there in superiority because we're dissecting the black on black criminal. Where the black, how the black on black criminal is created and the impact and motivations of the black on black criminal. Because he said, we are even worse than the criminals, us law abiding Negroes, us sellouts, us obedient, lawful, bill paying, church attended, degree holding black folks because we're not submitting to this system because it's right, because the system is corrupt at its core. There is no moral consumption under capitalism. We're not submitting because we have better judgment. It's because we have even more masterfully internalized the values of our system and more are better equipped to mimic the, the, the behaviors of our oppressors than the low class criminal. So really, the only way to be a good black person, a moral black person, is not to be law abiding or to be a petty gangster or criminal, it's to be revolutionary. And revolution is illegal. So revolutions are criminals as much as gangbangers. Except criminals or gangbangers or gangsters engage in crime for individual short term benefit and revolutionaries engage in crime for collective long term liberation but we're both we're all criminals except for the the sellouts and the submissive house slave types he goes on to talk about the because i'm black fallacy which i already covered so i won't go back into detail there because i'm very happy with the time i'm making he also has a chapter on genocide i'm sorry on suicide um where he talks about white sanctioned outlets for justified black rage so in the first part of the suicide chapter, he says, our oppressors understand we're going to need some outlets. Oppression, you know, all action has an equal opposite reaction. So white people have set up for what I call maladaptations or ways for black people to cope with our oppression and the rage that is bred by oppression that is not revolutionary. Because anything that's not revolutionary and liberation oriented is a maladaptation. Whether that's going to school, getting a good job and getting your degree and, and, and obeying the laws or taking it to the streets to secure the bag. Both of those are maladaptation. Anything less than revolution is a betrayal of our people and a subversion of our survivability, our very legacy. But anyway, Amos Wilson says, this is what white people allow for us to do 
in response for oppression. Number one is abject, abject submission. And in abject submission, you convince yourself that submitting to white power is the appropriate, moral, godly thing to do. Uh, what, what he called narcosis. And he equates drugs and religion to be the same. So if you throw yourself into drugs to escape reality, or you throw yourself into religion to say you're going to get your reward in a sweet by and by, those are pretty much what he called narcosis, the abuse of drugs and delusions for the purposes of escapism. Uh, deliberate ignorance, you know, ignorance is bliss. So you choose not to understand capitalism, white domination, Western history or, or you know, honor the troops. You choose not to make yourself aware of what the U.S. military is doing overseas or you convince yourself, you watch the corporate media and you accept those lies. You're deliberately deluding yourself. Uh, unending and unrewarding protest. So you can march, slogans, hashtags, you know, um, hidden grumbling, hidden grumbling. <laughs> You know, talking slick behind white folks back. That is allowed. Uh, over uh, compensatory status striving, securing the bag, success. And you know, this new thing where wealthy blacks don't have to listen to what poor black people are saying. You have people on so social media. Yo, um, you don't have to, if you get money, you don't listen to broke people. I don't hear you. If you don't talk money, I don't hear you. And there's that one meme where someone says, excuse me, brother. And the person turns around and says, uh, is this conversation going to give me money? Is this conversation about money? And if, if it's not about getting the white man's life tokens or life coupons, i.e. fiat currency, then black people don't even, shouldn't even be engaging with each other because our very worth in existence is defined by this shit that white people print at the Federal Reserve. So status striving is another form of escapism and, and allowable by our oppressors. Criminality, but the criminality must be black on black focused or also black on black homicide, which if you lash out because of oppression and you take your violence and your justified rage out on other black people, that's allowed. And finally, suicide. And Amos Wilson de defines suicide amongst oppressed people as displaced aggression or Dr. Bobby Wright said black people don't commit suicide we kill ourselves because to commit suicide is an act of ownership of yourself and if you're committing suicide based on uh, someone else's oppressive conditions they imposed on you you know we don't even have enough autonomy to commit suicide and I mean I know that's a play on words but the concepts are understood he calls you know black on black you know, um, when black people kill other blacks and lash out and create environments for themselves to shorten their lifespan, that's a form of, of, of indirect suicide. But all suicide is displaced aggression under oppression. And finally, the, the illusion where he hits on this more than once, where he says goodness under oppression is submissiveness. So you're not good, you're submissive. So all these people, Bill Cosby, before he was exposed for being a black on black criminal, used to talk on black on black criminals a lot. And he would say that black people should obey the law and a, and a byproduct of obeying the law is all other opportunities up, open up for you in this system, which is a myth. But, you know, goodness under oppression is submith, submith, submissiveness. Therefore, you have to commit to revolutionary struggle because whether you're a criminal or law abiding, if you're not engaged in revolutionary struggle against the omnicidal systems and institutions of oppression, white domination, and capitalism, you're not a good person. You're a submissive person. The final quote, um, Amos Wilson, I want to share, and then we're going to talk about what we can do to what um, Amos Wilson called neutralizing the black on black violence, is Wilson states, when the African-American father choose not to prepare their sons to undertake revolutionary overthrow of their oppressors, they betray their children and their race. They thereby, thereby earn the enmity of their sons and come to live in fear of them. They see them as the enemy. So when we fail to raise up radicalized revolutionary children, 
we create either submissive drones for our oppressors or criminals who will prey upon us. But now let's talk solutions. What can we do or what does Dr. Wilson suggest that we do for the what he calls the neutralization of black on black violence? First, he states, black self-defense and self-determination is viewed by whites as a criminal offense, as a threat to white authority. So you need to understand solutions for black people will put you in direct opposition of white people. And I know maybe some white folks want, I have nothing against black people solving their own problems. Republicans say that all the time. They're pull yourself up by the bootstraps. But you can simply look at history. Every time black people have organized, violently or nonviolently, whether we've organized in, in student groups, whether we organized in, in secular, whether we organized for economic upliftment, agriculture, repatriation, and get the hell out of here to Africa. There hasn't been one, not one in history, organized movement for black justice, black liberation, that was not deliberately and directly attacked by the system. Sometimes it's the government agencies, Sometimes it's private industries and corporations. Sometimes it's mercenaries. Sometimes it's police and soldiers. But you can't name one. And even movements, when black movements, are the, the US organizations and the Black Panther Party, the, the SNCC and, 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 and the Black Liberation Army, whether we come up for, for nonviolent prayer or armed resistance, they always come against us. So if you're interested in trying to engage in neutralization of uh, black on black violence if you want to heal or liberate black folks you automatically become an enemy of whites even and be mindful that many of these liberal good democratic progressive whites uh, if you look at Gloria Steinem she stated that when she became a CIA agent she was afraid to work for the CIA because she thought they would be all right-wing ultra-conservative. And when she joined the CIA, she found, and this quote's all over the internet, just put Gloria Steinem, CIA quote or something. She said, I found that they shared my values. They were progressive, they were liberal, they were inclusive and pro-diversity. They had all the values of all the liberals. So you might think, well, yeah, the races are gonna be against us. Anybody, any white people who profit from the systems and institutions of white domination will do what they need to do to preserve it. You know, that's the bottom line. But anyway, black crime conven uh, prevention, after you accept the fact that if you claim you wanna do something good for black folks, but you don't wanna attack the, the oppressive systems and oppressive institutions and identify yourself in opposition to the, the uh, global white domination, you're playing games. Uh, but black crime prevention. Um, First, he says, we have to recapture our Afrocentric selves. We have to begin to recenter, prioritize, and align ourselves with our African heritage, our African culture, the African mentality and personality, and our brothers and sisters on the African continent and the larger African diaspora. It's a monumental task. Therefore, ADOS, Foundational Black America, they are enemies of our liberation, and they uh, are, are subversive to the interest of black and especially preventing black on black crime. Secondly, we have to rebuild, recreate African-based cultural and moral values, which is part of recapturing our African, African self. Three, build Afrocentric national and international economic, military, technological, and political systems. Next, provide our children Afro Afrocentric education based on Afrocentric psychology and pedagogical techniques build independent housing and employment, make and overthrow, um, make the overthrow, I'm sorry, make the overthrow of European and Eurocentric and any other groups, psychopolitical, psychocultural, socioeconomic, techno-military, religio-ethnic domination of African people. No one can dominate us. No one should have authority over us. No one is fit to rule us other than us and take our destiny into our own hands. And the thing about these uh, solutions that he gives, they're quite simple. And you could start today without a dime in your pocket, you know, without a book in your hand. It's relatively straightforward. It's relatively simple and it's pretty much natural. We could do it naturally if we didn't have these oppositions. So those are his solutions. 
and pay as much attention to what he proposes we do to what he doesn't propose. And think about how many solutions that are on the table for not just black on black violence, but to end black subjugation and oppression that have nothing to do with Amos very clear and cogent list. But anyway, that's, I'm concluding. My next book will Who Stole the Soul? And that will be uh, post haste. It will be coming out very soon. I'm going to go back to doing weekly book reviews. So likes and subscribe to the channel. Um, also, you can support various ways. I'm sure it should be on the screen right now, the various ways you can support the Bro Diallo Show. Um, I uh, reread this book. I had already read it, but I read it a second, and I think this is my third reading of this book. Um, I tried to distill it down to the major points um, because, it, like I said, Amos Wilson's books are so content heavy, so well researched. Um, I don't think there's any legitimate crimin black criminologist or black uh, social justice or restorative justice person that hasn't read this book. They're not really um, serious about um, ending black on black violence. They just want to put salves on festering wounds. But anyway, thank you for joining me for uh, black on black violence. Um, Thank you to, to all of my supporters. Shout out, of course, to co-conspirator number two, Chauncey. Shout out to Q4 Radio. And um, have a good morning, evening, afternoon, because this is tape, so I don't know when you'll be watching this. But please like, share, subscribe, support the Bro Diallo Show. Support Bro Diallo, Diallo Kenyatta at patreon.com. You can cash app a, your homie, you know, to, to help sustain progressive, independent, radical media. And if you have a book, you'd like for me to review in the Bo Diallo book review, drop it in the comments. Anyway, that's it. I'm going to wrap it up. Peace.